Okay. Okay, so uh, one question um, that uh, was asked um, was an unbloody sacrifice. So under Last Supper, Jesus, they don't slaughter the lamb. Instead, Jesus makes it clear that in the bread and the wine now are his body and blood. By saying unbloody sacrifice, we're saying like he didn't, at the, at, the, uh, at the Last Supper, there wasn't a slaughter, and every time we celebrate the Mass, we're not slaughtering him again, or ha we don't need to do some sort of animal slaughter or human slaughter. So it's not bloody in that sense. But in the sense of, is Jesus' blood present? Yes. But it's not... It's not. It's a. It's a sacrifice where we are entering into the one sacrifice and not needing to re-sacrifice him and make him bloody again. He's just giving us access to the one sacrifice that he made, body and blood. Does that does that help? Okay. So we're not. Yeah. When I say unbloody, I'm not saying it, it's not really his blood. It's just wine. No. It it is really his blood, but it's not a bloody sacrifice. Um, being recreated, it's our participation in the one sacrifice, which was bloody for sure. Okay, so if you flip your page over, we're going to talk about who celebrates, how we celebrate, when we celebrate, where we celebrate. We're going to try to do that quickly. Uh, okay, so who celebrates? The whole body of Christ. Liturgy is not private. Even when I, we've got a little chapel in the, in the, um, uh, in the rectory, um, and the Blessed Sacrament is reposed there so that we can pray, and um, I'll, I'll, we'll expose the Blessed Sacrament if we want to have like a holy hour. Um, but sometimes I'll celebrate Mass there, and even though I'm the only one there, it's not my private Mass, and I'm not really the only one there. Everyone in Purgatory is there. All the saints and angels are there. No Mass is private. No Mass is singular. It's always the whole body of Christ participating. Um, who celebrates? It's the faithful gathered under the authority of the bishop, who is their shepherd. We can't celebrate Masses if we don't have the authority of the bishop. Okay? Um, especially not, like, public Masses. Um, who is celebrating? So we have priests, we've got deacons, servers, lectors, choir members, maybe a comment, commentator, uh, ushers. Here at St. Joe, we also have hospitality ministers. We have tech ministers. Um, so all of them are participating in some way. They all have a role to play. But it's also every single person that's there. Every single person is participating and celebrating the Mass. And in Sancro Sanctum Concilium, one of the documents of the Second Vatican Council, it talks about full and active participation of everybody that goes to Mass. What does that mean? What, are some, what would you say are some aspects of someone fully and actively participating when they go to Mass? They sing. Pray. They pray. Go to communion. They receive the Eucharist. If they can. Otherwise, maybe receive a blessing. What else? They pray the rosary. They might pray the rosary beforehand, but 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 technically, like they probably shouldn't be playing, praying the rosary during Mass, which. During the, during, in Latin Masses, if you ever go to a Latin Mass, the, you might see people there who are praying the rosary. It, it's okay. But, but when the Second Vatican Council was thinking of full and active participation, they wanted people to be locked in to what was happening at Mass and to try to participate in that. And to maybe not bring other prayers in that might distract us from what's going on at the time. Not, there's nothing wrong with the rosary. I pray it every day. We should all pray the rosary regularly. Mary is leading us to Jesus. All of that. But 
when we're at Mass, we should be praying to Mass. So listening, right? Um, responding, just responding, doing any of the responses. Kneeling, standing, um, sharing the sign of peace when that moment comes, and trying to just be fully present. When we have distractions, trying to push them out of our mind as quickly as we can. And they're going to come. It's going to happen. I'm distracted during Mass pretty much every day. <laughs> but if we're trying to really fully and actively participate, we're going to try to push those to the side so that we can stay focused in. Um, and uh, maybe here would be a good place to be. Yeah. Say what we believe as a Catholic. Yeah, praying the creed. Yes. Yep. Yep. And also the Lord's Prayer. Praying the Lord's Prayer together. Sure. Um, so, uh, um, Zephan um, had asked about uh, sometimes you people, and, and he gave himself as an example, but a lot of people do this, especially in Johnson County. It's like, okay, uh, I want to sleep in till 10 today, so what parish has a mass that I could go to? <laughs> we do a lot of uh, boundary crossing when it comes to mass. And, and I, I, I'm okay with people, if they're in a different boundary, going to a different church, we have a lot of people here at St. Joe that do that, I, I, and, I, and I understand that. But um, we should try to be going to our own home parish as much as we can, um, because that is the community that God is raising us up in. And not only are they there for us to help us grow as Christians, as Catholics, we are there to help them grow as Christians and Catholics. So it isn't just a matter of, oh, I, I need to get my Sunday obligation and I need to go to Mass somewhere so I can get that in. Some weekends, maybe that's the best we can do. But ideally, we are celebrating the Mass with the brothers and sisters of our parish community so that we are building community in Mass. Worshiping together helps, us, helps to bring us together, okay? Again, there are going to be times where we need to go somewhere else. Totally get it. The, the Lord just wants you to, to show up and to fully and actively participate wherever you go. But he would like you to be able to really plug into a parish and live your faith there. Okay, how do we celebrate? Smells and bells, right? Have you ever heard that? <laughs> Catholics love their smells and bells. We love incense. We love ringing the bell. We are rich in signs and symbols and rituals. And I find oftentimes I'll talk to Catholics who have strayed and come back. And the reason they came back is because they missed the rituals. They're like, I went to, to an evangelical church and the preaching was great, the music was great, but I missed the ritual. That familiarity, that comfort that we get because I think it's, it was built into us. It's not like something that we came up with, like life's going to be easier if we would just come up with some rituals. And it was some sort of, um, you know, uh, social construct that happened at some point. No, it's built into us to have ritual. We have a, a daily sleep pattern that God built into us. There are things that were built into us ritualistically because it's just good for us. The liturgy is no different. It has rituals because we were made for that. And when we don't have it, we long for it. Now, can rituals, can we um, think that they're, can we get too used to them or think they're humdrum or not really find the meaning in them anymore? Yeah, certainly they, that, that can happen and we've got to keep fighting against that. And I, as a, as a preacher and a presider, need to keep fighting against that and helping people not to feel like they're just um, going to the same old thing, but to also use rituals to help us. All our senses are involved. We're looking at the altar. We are smelling the incense. We are feeling the, 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 the embrace of our, our 
our brother or sister during the, uh, the sign of peace. We are tasting the Eucharist. We are hearing the word. All of our senses are engaged. Um, we have rubrics. So you'll notice at Mass, the little server brings that big book up to the priest, right? Um, I can remember when, when I was a kid, I, I loved serving, and I served the whole um, triduum, so Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, Easter Vigil, um, and that was like, that was the most awesome thing. And there was one time where I, uh, during the Easter Vigil, like, you'll notice we're going to be holding the book a lot because we're going to have all, diff all these different, so I was holding the book for like 20 minutes, and after I was like, oh my gosh, how in the world, that was so long. But, so the Roman Missal has all of the prayers in it for us. So I'm not coming up with new prayers each time. Like they are built in there. Again, so no matter where you go, you're going to hear the same prayers. And they're usually built around uh, maybe the readings for that day or the feast that's being celebrated. And that's all contained in the Missal. And this idea of lex orandi, lex credendi, the way that we pray um, the law of our prayer, the lex orandi, informs the law of our belief. Sometimes we come to understand what we believe even better because of the way that we've prayed it. So the two of them uh, help each other. But even though you could go to any Roman Catholic church in the world and it would have the same prayers and everything like that, <coughs> there, is, there are different rites within the Catholic church. So Latin, Byzantine, uh, Coptic, Syrian, all these different rites. There are also Orthodox churches. And, and the, the, the Roman Catholic Church and Orthodox churches are not <coughs> completely in union. But there are churches that use Orthodox rites, like the Byzantine Orthodox rite. They use that, but they are in union with the Catholic Church. And so they just have the Byzantine Rite, but they're a Byzantine Rite Roman Catholic Church, okay? So you could go to, if you, for some reason you found like a, an Armenian church somewhere, if it's in union with the, the church, you, you, could, you could go there for your Sunday Mass and you would, be, you would be fulfilling your Sunday obligation. You can go to an Orthodox church if you have absolutely no other options, but the church would prefer that you went to, um, went to Mass um, in a church that's in union with, with Rome. When do we celebrate? Uh, the liturgical year uh, uses nature's cycle to express the entire mystery of Christ. But we have seasons. We're about to enter Advent, which is a time of preparation for Christmas. And then we enter into ordinary time. And then we have Lent. And we have Easter. And these happen year after year. Again, there's sort of a ritual to that because it's built into us to want to revisit and re-experience um, these important elements of Jesus' life. Although I can sum this up in a quick little drawing, his whole life can't be summed up in a day. Um, and so the church spreads out his life throughout the whole year using ordinary time, uh, Advent and Christmas, ordinary time, and then Lent and Easter. And we celebrate feasts, we have cycles of saints, because these are all things that we want to celebrate. These are all things that are great. And so we celebrate them. All of them point to God. All of them point to Jesus. But they're just different ways that his Paschal mystery has been lived out throughout history. And then uh, there are other um, sacraments, or sorry, uh, there are other ways that we celebrate liturgy, and one of them is called the Liturgy of the Hours. Who's heard of that before? Okay, good, a good chunk of you. So a priest, religious, and a lot of, a lot of uh, lay people pray the Liturgy of the Hours every day. There's morning prayer, daytime prayer, evening prayer, night prayer, and then office of readings. And they're called five hours, but they don't each take an hour. Um, they're anywhere from like five to ten minutes. But it's times throughout the day where the church stops 
and prays for herself, for her whole body, for the whole body of Christ. The church is stopping and saying, as, as important as all the work is, we need to stop and pray. And so I pray at these five different times through the day. Um, and I pray for each, each hour is dedicated to a different thing. You, uh, I pray for St. Joseph in my morning prayer. I pray for the deaf community in my daytime prayer. Office of readings, I pray for the seminarians because I help with both of those communities. And then the two others uh, are kind of open for anything that might have happened that day that uh, needs my prayers. Um, but that is liturgy. That is also this ritual that we uh, use to help us enter into the Paschal Mystery. Where do we celebrate? Uh, the whole earth is entrusted to the people of God, but practically our worship happens in a church, a house of prayer. Uh, but we are also um, living stones built into a spiritual house. Um, but it's, it's most appropriate to do it in a church. Um, but you can. I've celebrated Mass, again, in the rectory, um, in my parents' house. Uh, I've celebrated in a... Uh, airport in Dubai. Um, I've celebrated at a Texas roadhouse. So I, I've celebrated Mass in a lot of different ways. Yeah. I know there were exceptions for the pandemic, but is online still considered celebrating Mass? So if someone is, is physically or, or, or um, because of health unable to come to Mass, their Sunday obligation is lifted but they could participate by watching online. But no one's Sunday obligation is fulfilled by watching online. It's only supposed to be there for those who, because of their health, um, or because of, yeah, because of their health, um, are unable to actually be present at Mass. Good question. Um, last thing I'll say. Uh, yeah, right. No, really. Um, last thing I'll say. Sacraments are all liturgical. So the, the Mass is the primary liturgy of the church, but when you go to our penance service, um, either in Advent or at Lent, that is a, that's a liturgy. A baptism has a lot of liturgical elements to it. Anointings have a liturgical elements. Confirmation, uh, matrimony, holy orders. They're always either in a Mass or they have elements of the Word um, and they have special prayers that are prayed all as part of the liturgy, all as part of bringing this into our lives um, in a very concrete and real way. So, that's it. So I want to make sure we got time for our closing prayer in the gospel. Questions? <coughs> Jim. Uh, there, uh, there are elements of liturgy in just going to confession. Yeah, there's a there's a ritual that you go through. Oh yeah, thank you. Okay, someone wanted to know the difference between doctrine and dogma, and my my helper over here. So doctrine. Um, in the Old Testament, the usual meaning of this term was instruction or something heard or received or a pronouncement. Christian doctrine, however, comprehends that body of revealed and divine truth which a Catholic must hold, but frequently extends to those teachings which are not, which are not of the faith but are held and acted upon. Maybe that's not super helpful, but... Um, these are the, the basically these are the, the teachings of the church that it, that, it, that a Catholic <coughs> should should hold as true. A dogma um, is a truth revealed by God and therefore an article of faith. Um, so it is proposed to be believed by all Catholics. Um, some of the dogmas are the incarnation. So it's revealed by God that Jesus, that the second person of the Trinity became human. That's the incarnation. And we as Catholics are, are to believe that as an, an article of our faith. The redemption, the fact that he died on the cross, and that 
saved us from our sins, and then he rose from the dead to give us access to heaven. That is a dogma. The assumption of Mary into heaven, that her body did, was not subject to corruption of, of death, but that her body and soul were both assumed into heaven, that is a dogma to be believed by Catholics. So doctrine in, incorporates, incorporates like all of the teachings of the church, but dogmas are specific elements of the doctrine that have been revealed by God to be um, proclaimed as uh, articles of faith in the church. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a distinction between those two. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.